Hi, I'm Stephen Tallamy. If you've followed my channel for a while, you would have seen my rediscoveries of some 90s synths, the JV1080 and the Protus 2000. These were the only two modules I owned until something very exciting happened. A few weeks ago, a user called Limbic Legion commented on my JV1080 video saying it had inspired him to dig out his JV1080, Proteus and a few other synths. Limbic explained that he's planning to clean out his Aladdin's cave of old gear and one of the modules that he'd found was something I had coveted many years ago but had never had the money to buy. This was the Korg M1, or in this case the rack-mounted version, the Korg M1R. As an act of massive generosity, Limbic said I could have his Korg M1 in return for a donation to the piano book We Make Voices charity campaign. He even arranged for the module to be delivered directly to my doorstep. Now the Korg M1 is legendary for being the biggest selling synthesizer of all time. It was released in 1988 and quickly became the sound of the late 80s and throughout the 90s. At the time, the other two big named digital synthesizers on the market were the Yamaha DX7 FM synth and the Roland D50 subtractive synth. The Korg M1 took a different approach by incorporating PCM samples and an onboard sequencer, dubbing the term digital workstation. The sounds at the time were a massive leap forward in terms of realism, especially for a synth at its price point. It was 16 note polyphony, eight part timbrality, and had four megabytes of onboard sounds. Coming out six years before the JV1080 and over 10 years before the Proteus 2000, it does have its limitations, but it was still a massively powerful synthesizer of the time. Let's start by dispelling a myth. A lot of people actually think that the slap bass in the Korg M1 is used in the Seinfeld theme. Now, if you go and listen to Score the Podcast and a few other interviews, you'll find that actually it was a blend of all sorts of different slap bass sounds recorded into a sampler. However, if you ever do need to recreate a Seinfeld like slap bass then uh, the patch 48 slap bass is a very good option. So one of the sounds that made the Korg M1 uh, very popular was the piano sound. It was used in Madonna's Vogue and a whole range of ones. I'll play a little bit of the piano part from Rhythm is a Dancer. So definitely got that particular 80s vibe dance piano and probably one of the most well-known sounds. Now, the Korg M1 has actually been used in quite a lot of media composition as well. Um, I believe it was used in a whole range of game soundtracks. I think Lego Island, um, Field of Dreams may have used it. Vangelis definitely used it. Um, Hans Zimmer used it in a bunch of places. Black Rain, I believe, and True Romance. So... I'm not entirely sure how they've used the instrument in those particular things, but you can certainly hear elements of them. Let's just try one of the patches here. This is the Vibes patch, and I'm going to add a, just a little bit of delay to it to make it a little bit more like what I expect the patch may have been. If it was the M1, it may well have been a live player. So what I've done is add a little bit of stereo delay to this Vibes patch uh, to recreate something a little bit like the True Romance start. Now, I'll leave it to you to whether you think it actually matches what's there. So there are actually some other quite nice cinematic sounds that we can play with. These Koto Trems are really quite nice. So somewhat reminiscent of the Spitfire Audio Mandolin Swarm kind of sound. So what I'm going to do now is actually tune the instrument up a little bit because the track that I'm about to play is actually played slightly up from standard pitch. So definitely the Cork M1 was all over the Queen Innuendo album. Uh, here's part from I'm Going Slightly Mad. <laughs> A 
And if you look at the score for Jerry Goldsmith's Total Recall, you'll see the synths in there. And I believe those were also Korg M1s. For example, we could create the introduction part using this same choir patch. But I've left probably the most well-known sound of the M1 to the end, the organ two. And this was really basically the bass line riff of so much of the 90s. Here's a little bit of Show Me Love. So let's take a look at the front panel here. So as I mentioned before, the Korg M1 was interesting in so much as it had a sequencer built into it, which meant that you could actually do eight tracks uh, and record an entire band uh, using the onboard sequencer. Now, I'm not really going to get into the sequencer because really for me, I would use Logic for all of that kind of stuff. Um, there's also this combi mode here. This allows you to play multiple tones at once. And often this would be used to layer different sounds or maybe even and do a keyboard split so the bass part was one patch and the upper parts were something else so here's one of the ensembles So that just gives you an idea of how you can layer out the sounds. But I'm really going to look at the program section here so that we can look at some of the controls that are available. So you can see here I've got the brass patch uploaded. And along the bottom here, we've got these sort of what I call quick edit uh, options here. So these are things that have been exposed up to the front panel that allow you to change some of the parameters of the patch without going into the deep editing part of it. So you can see here we've got a filter cutoff um, that I can control. So if I play the patch, So we can play around with the filter from the front end. We've also got a number of other controls here. We can play with the attack time, so we can really have a punchy brassy sound. Or we can make the attack a lot longer. And the other thing on the quick edits that is kind of useful is also this effects balance. So on board in this patch there'll be certain effects and I can crank them up or down. So these quick edits sort of remind me a little bit of the Proteus in many ways, uh, that you can quickly edit a few parameters with the dial. Obviously, there's no individual knobs, which I think would make this even easier and more tweakable. Let's have a look also now under the hood at how we can edit a program. So for this, I'm going to play around with this uh, patch 40, which is the magician sound. So each patch can be uh, made either of a single tone or a double tone. You can see this one is actually made of two tones. If we go to the next page, you'll see one of the tones is a pan flute and the other tone is a brass sound. Now, just to demonstrate some of the other functions, I'm actually going to turn this into a single instrument. So now we're only dealing with one oscillator, which is the pan flute. So onto the next pages here. When this one's quite interesting. This is an envelope generator for the pitch. So typically when you think about envelope generators, what they're doing is they're going to either be adjusting the level of the patch, so to provide an attack and release of the volume, or it might be controlling a filter to make it sort of have more filtery sounds at the beginning or at the end. But this is actually going to modify the pitch over time. So what you can see here is that this is bending up from a negative pitch uh, with a particular attack. So if you listen to the sound, so what you can see there is it's actually bending up into the note, uh, which is probably quite normal for a pan flute type of sound. Let's make it a bit more extreme um, so that you can hear the effect even more. But we can also uh, change here the attack time, how fast for it to rise up through that pitch. So let's make that a lot longer.
We've got various other things in terms of the level it's going to be at and then a decay in this one. You might have heard that as I release it, it is also releasing the pitch and turning it up at the very end. But there's some interesting parameters here that are going to say how much the velocity sensitivity of the keyboard is going to affect both the level in which it's going to work and also the time. So let's play with the time one because this is quite interesting. If I play the notes softly or if I play it loudly it will actually speed up the attack time. So let's crank the this up quite a lot so we can really hear it. And let's put the attack time back up quite a lot. So if I play softly So we're getting a very slow attack. Now if I play it loud, So this is really interesting to have this real-time control based on the velocity and it's one of the things that makes the Korg M1 quite nice to play is because you've got all of this tweakability and control dependent on the level of your playing. So let's just quickly pick another patch here. Let's go back to the organ. So one of the things unfortunately about the filter here is that you can see it's got a cutoff and an intensity but it doesn't actually have any sort of resonance and that's a real shame because that's often a sound that you're going to be using inside of synth sounds is to have that resonance sweep. It's a very characteristic thing. You know, it's a, it's a useful filter, but maybe not as characterful as maybe some of the other filters that I've seen on the other synthesizers. Then you've got your usual filter envelope, so how the filter gets changed over time, and you've got the sensitivity and all those things that we had before on the previous pitch one. And similarly, we've got a whole bunch more parameters around a VDA. So this is your amplitude being changed by the envelope generator and so on. So here we have a pitch MG, so this is basically like an LFO, so you can set the frequency of it and also the delay. And we've got the same thing also for the filter. So you do have a little bit of patchability here, so you can assign your pitch bend controller to uh, very certain things. And then you're into your effects, and you've got two effects here. So this one's got a chorus on it, and it's also got a reverb hall on it. And you can decide whether you want your effects to be serial, or you can have them in parallel with each other. So the M1 itself doesn't technically store any presets inside of itself. It does store all of those four megabytes of PCM samples, but the presets are stored under battery power. So if the battery goes, you lose all of those sounds. But effectively, it means that the 99 banks that there are on the M1 are all actually user presets. Um, and they come out the box with a set of sounds that we saw at the very beginning in the video. But you can load your own ones in as well. Now, if you do pick up an M1, there's likelihood that you may need to change the battery. It's very easy to do. It's just a standard uh, watch style battery. And then you'll come along to the Korg website and they have this download here where you can download the SysX to load it up into the instrument. So if you don't have the original card that came with the Korg M1 to load in the presets, you can actually use this here. And I use the SysX librarian to do that. So you can see I've got that loaded up. But there are also a few other patches out there and sound sets that bring the Korg M1 right up to date. And just like I found for the JV1080, LFO Store have another excellent set of presets, which are these analog and ambient sounds. So again, you can just buy these, download them, get the SysX file and load them up into SysX Librarium or your favorite uh, SysX player. And you can see I'm going to load that now onto the Korg M1R. And with that done, I'm just going to reboot the M1. And just like that, we have some uh, additional patches. So let's play through some of them.
So now let's have a look at how we might incorporate the Quark M1 into a logic session so that I can be using it in part of my workflow. So the same as I did with the Proteus and the JV1080, the first step is to go into the MIDI environment and set up an instrument. Now the Quark M1 doesn't have more than one bank, it only has one bank of presets so we don't really need to be worrying about bank messages at all um, and so effectively all we need to do here is find a patch list, copy and paste it in and we've got the 99 different uh, patches available and now I should be able to control from here um, the different patches so you can see I'm now controlling the patch messages that are going to the machine um, or more likely I will go in and create a list of program events and then be able to switch through them inside of the logic session. So what I wanted to do is if I could control some of the other parameters of the M1 from within the DAW environment. Now I didn't really find a patch editor, certainly not one that was free, that was going to allow me to do this. So I thought I'd have a go at seeing if I could program it directly inside of Logic. So all the parameters of the Core Game 1 are controllable, but unlike maybe some of the other synths, not many of them are controllable using the normal control messages, the CC messages that you might be outputting from maybe a MIDI controller. So everything really is editable mostly using system exclusive events. So what I've done within the MIDI environment is I have created this dedicated set of controls that allow me to adjust the different parameters of the M1. So along the top here I've got access to what I call those quick edit controls so I can now move up and down the filter. And I've got all of the other things so the attack. and the effects balance. So what you'll see is this fader here is actually a system exclusive fader and if we open the SysX fader editor you can see a whole bunch of junk is getting sent to the machine here. I'm not going to go into all the details of system exclusive uh, editing. The most important thing to know is that you know this first part is saying this is a Korg instrument, you can see it's saying it there, and then this is saying which particular parameters we want to control and where it says val this is saying uh, these are the values I want to be able to control using the slider itself. But what I've also done on this is I've added a MIDI CC input to this so it inputs via a control message and then outputs a system exclusive which means now I can use normal CC messages from a MIDI controller. What you'll see here is I've mapped 33 through 39 on this top row, uh, 18 through 19 this row and so on. So different rows of this I've mapped different CC messages but I put this input mapper at the very beginning to allow me to adjust those parameters uh, as I would like to. So if we take a look at this input map you can see that at the moment I've got the uh, CC messages being modified but at the moment they're just being modified exactly the same. One goes to one, two, three, four and so on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my monogram uh, MIDI control controller here and I'm going to change the CC11. You can see I've got a little monitor in here that's showing that CC message going in and a CC message going out. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to map this CC11 through to uh, the VDF cutoff which is 33. So if we take here and put 11 and we want to map that to 33. Now you can see if I move this up and down I have now got the ability to change the MIDI cutoff. But what I want to do is maybe something a little bit more interesting and actually manipulate some of the parameters within the edit panel. Now I'm actually running in the edit mode, I've got the ability to change parameters. So now I can actually adjust the VDF cutoff with a lot more resolution here. So I can be moving this up and down. So if I now assign MIDI CC 11 to 18, I can move that up and down in more detail. 11 through to 18. So now if we move the monogram up and down, you can see I'm moving the cutoff. So this is quite interesting. What if I could automate some of these parameters so that they responded in some way to my performance? Well, that's where I need an envelope generator. So if you've watched my video about connecting my MIDI equipment to my modular equipment, you'll see that I quite like using Reactor for this type of thing. And so what I've got set up here in Reactor is a relatively simple patch. Effectively, it's monitoring notes in, and then it is sending that into a trigger of an envelope. 
and so I've got a fairly simple envelope with a, an attack, decay, etc. Then I'm sending that into a VCA just so I can control the amount that it's going to send. And then what it's going to do is it's going to send that to MIDI CC 103. So we can actually control uh, any of these values here now using this envelope. I'm going to do, need to do a little bit of wiring up. But just to see what is happening here, if I hit a note on my MIDI keyboard, you will see here but I'm getting a little envelope that's being sent. But it's not yet being routed into Logic. I need to do a little bit more to make that happen. So I'd like to change the effect here um, of this, and I'm going to use maybe the, uh, the overdrive here. So I'd like to be able to change the drive of this. Uh, now you can see I'm already moving that up and down using this slider. So now if we take a look here, we've got this reactor virtual input. I'm running reactor in a standalone mode. So it actually gets this virtual um, output, MIDI output that I can actually wire into my chain. So with that wired up, um, we can now bring up reactor again. And you can see I'm sending this out on 103. So you can see this row here is 102. So that's 103, 104, 105. So we're going to actually move this one using this envelope generator. So now if you see, if I hit a note, you can see that the envelope is now controlling that. And we can fiddle about with the attack and delay so we can make it quite fast. Or pretty slow. So as you can imagine, with the reactor blocks or even sending this out to the modular equipment, there's a lot of fun to be had. It is worth mentioning that Korg themselves have various editions of virtual versions of the Korg M1. If you go to korg.shop and uh, go to the software section, you'll see they have a whole collection that you can buy, which will include the ARP Odyssey, the Triton and the Korg M1, or you can uh, buy it individually as its own plugin here. You can also get it on iPad as well. So if you want to buy it that way, and right now I think as you watch this video, it's on quite a good deal of £15. So a really good way of getting your hands on a Korg M1 if you haven't got the actual instrument itself. Um, and of course, if you've got an iPad with an input, you can even control it via MIDI take a quick look at the plugin version of it you can see here we've got uh, a, quite a nice interface here we've got the same buttons for um, multis and combis there's no sequencer uh, available which probably makes sense um, so here is a program here this was the magician patch that we were looking at earlier And you can see here right into looking at the way in which the oscillator is controlled, the filters and so on. So quite a nice uh, representation of this. Actually, something they added on top of the Korg M1 original is they have added that resonance into the filter, which does make a bit of a difference. But of course, will mean that if you make any changes or make an instrument on here, it's never going to sound the same on a real Korg M1. Um, also, what is worth uh, noting on this is that in the browser, you can browse all of the different cards that were available. So you could actually plug cards into the Korg M1. So this is the default set. This is the set that we were playing with earlier. So if you want to have that classic Organ 2 sound, you can get it just as well from uh, here. Uh, but you've got all of the other different cards here that were sold over time. Um, and you can see there was an organ patch, there was a brass one, ethnics and so on. So these are ways of getting hold of all of the range of those cards that were also available uh, with the original Korg M1. So this can be really useful if you're out on the go, if you want to have a portable version of it, even if you do have the Korg M1, you've got a virtual instrument version of it. One thing I will note is that it doesn't have the same abilities necessarily to read and write all of the custom patches that I was showing you earlier on the real Korg M1. Now I know there are some people who have a love-hate relationship with the Korg M1. It was plastered over so much of the 90s. There is a particular sound you're going to get out of the box with the Korg M1, and whether you like that or not, it's really up to you. But hopefully I've shown you there's a lot more to this synth if you apply some modern production techniques. But for me, it's not just about how these synths sound, but how they make you feel. 
and for me getting my hands on one of my original dream synths is both nostalgic and inspiring. If you've enjoyed this video then please do give a massive thumbs up to the amazingly generous Limbic who made all of it possible. And a big thanks to everyone who's been watching these videos. If you enjoy them then please do consider subscribing and I'll see you on the next one.